Thank you. And apologies for picking a title with so many P's in it. I feel like it's a bit of a tongue twister today. Um, but yeah, really, uh, really happy to uh, to be with everyone today and to just share a little bit about um, how I'm thinking about um, about premium in programmatic um, as we do begin to come out of this um, the sort of the hopefully depending on where you're you're joining us from that the hopefully we're now coming out of the the worst of the pandemic and so uh, for those of you who don't know me. Already, um, my name's Katie Jones. I'm the commercial director here at, um, at Beeswax. See, I'm um, part of the, the Freewheel family, and I'll be drawing on some of the, um, the stats from some research that, that Freewheel have done recently as we, as we move uh, through the, uh, the slides today. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit to start with about the sort of the, the promise of digital advertising, really specifically the sort of promise of programmatic and that um, sort of idea that you could finally do one-to-one -one messaging with the people that were most meaningful you, full, um, for your brand and for the campaigns that you were running. And I think initially as, um, as digital advertising sort of became into the mainstream, mainstream and, and, and programmatic sort of became the, the dominant mechanism by which digital advertising is, is transacted. Um, we've seen this huge surge um, towards performance. You know, it really meant using cookies to target and to retarget users. It, it meant different attribution strategies. Um, it was really the culture of of new, you know, if, if you could suddenly do something that was impossible and had historically always been impossible in, in media and marketing. And it came with a ton of really, um, really nice benefits. So the benefits of being able to reach the audiences that you wanted to, so the benefit of targeting, the benefit of being able to do that at scale and the huge benefit really of, of automation, of, of being able to, to plug into a platform and access that supply across all of the, the different partners that you wanted to, to work with. And um, I want to take us back in time a little bit now, just to thinking about the sort of, um, you know, back really like five years ago, so we're talking way pre-pandemic, um, thinking about um, about 2016 and I know um, this moment will be etched in, in most people's minds but the, the moment they read or if you were lucky to be there in, enough to be there in person but you heard Mark Pritchard um, who um, at, uh, at P&G say uh, really publicly that they targeted too much and they went too narrow um, and um, I really hesitated with this slide, whether to use this quote or whether to use a quote from, I think it was actually the year before when Marissa Mayer, who was running Yahoo at the time, she said very publicly also, the opposite of programmatic is manual and not premium. And so if we're going back five years, we started to have this, this feeling that one-to-one -one targeting and, um, and performance and seeing good results didn't necessarily, um, it really could also be involved in the, in the sort of most premium ends of the media. And I think really for me, those two um, pieces have sort of uh, pointed out some really, really big trends that we've seen evolve in the last five years. And I think, um, so one of those is really the, the move, not only through private marketplaces, but also now with programmatic guaranteed being such, a dom such a, an important um, transaction mechanism. So that's the, the, really the sort of the, the, the flow towards um, better connections with the partners and the, the premium inventory that works for you. Also, um, I think within that is, um, I think we can also track through that same journey, um, the rise of, of digital video as a format that's adopted. I picked um, UK stats uh, just for, for ease when building this slide, but I think if you picked pretty much any 
market in the world, um, you'd see this really similar trend over the last um, over the last five years. And um, I think what you know how this relates is is that advertising advertisers, you know, buyers, their agencies are really demanding the same kind of benefits they've been used to seeing through um, through you know the original sort of. Um, push of, of programmatic so scale automation targeting or, or or relevance and they've perhaps started to think that, that that could be the case not only on computers but then also on tablets and mobiles and, and increasingly on on bigger screens on on tv screens in the living rooms uh, living room behind me and so uh, as you see here you know across europe um, so I said this is UK stats, but across Europe, and we've seen um, VOD spending increase 30 fold between 2010 and 2020. And that that indicates the trajectory it was on really before even viewers began spending so much more time with media due to the the events that we've lived through in 2020. And so Stepping back from the, the, the many challenges and, and difficult times that I know so many of us have, have lived through in the last year and a half, there are undeniably some things that have just changed permanently in the way that, that um, specifically within the, the media operates. I picked this photo to represent the digital transformation that's happening in, in each and, and every communication channel and I, I mentioned I'd share some some stats from from free will but our, our parent company free will recently ran a study in conjunction with an independent consumer focused market research company called happy demics and um, the the purpose of this research and we can I happily share this with you afterwards if if anyone would like to see the report um, to go into it in more detail but um, it really explores how that increase in in connectivity and that that digital transformation has really translated into the the European TV space um, so the results are really quite staggering um, so I had apps for me I, I was really shocked to 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 see this sort of 70 percent stat um, across the main countries in Europe of people who have already connected their TV set to the internet and it sort of really brings home to me that TV watching is now predominantly a connected experience across most of, of Europe. In the UK and France, I, I wanted to call those two out specifically because it's even higher. Um, we're looking at 80% um, at and 77% and respectively. And so with that adoption of, of, of um, connected TV devices, there's a lot more choice for brands who are thinking about how they can operate in that in that CTV environment. And I always think it's helpful to have um, a bit of a reflection around the, the different types of really consumer choice that are that are that are offered to, to users. And then we can think about what that might mean for us in the in the in the marketing media space. You know, how might advertisers want to use those different types of inventory um, differently and so um, firstly I think it's, it's worth uh, worth pointing out that so across the board across Europe nine out of ten Europeans who took part in the survey are regularly using those connected TV devices to access um, video on demand inventory but there are lots of different types of um, VOD inventory I've used the cup sizing here um, just as sort of uh, an in indication. There is a huge amount of variance by market. I'm sure we have um, people joining us from all over Europe. So uh, to give a, a bit of a, a difference, this is the sort of sizing we see based on the, the type of, um, of VOD that people are uh, engaging with generally across Europe. But in France, 
there's probably a, there's a, a bigger sway towards uh, broadcaster VOD um, over um, and and uh, subscription VOD, so SVOD. Um, those are at sort of 58 and 57 percent respectively. Whereas in Germany, those two are neck and neck at 54 percent of the market. Um, so there is a sort of sometimes the BVOD and the SVOD cups are the other way around, <laughs> or the labels the other way around, maybe not the cups. And um, AVOD is, is an interesting one in Europe because it, it currently is only representing a, a really small portion of VOD viewing, um, perhaps between 10 and 20% of, um, of CTV owners sort of saying that they're using it, but it's really new. And I think this is the area where if we put our sort of, forward facing future looking um, hats on we can sort of start to see that we um, we do expect to see a lot more expansion perhaps um, within this and um, because really because consumers are are interested in um, in it they see it as a a way of um, of um, accessing content that they want and um, in these formats again this is um, also in the in in the report, and we may talk about a bit more about this. But generally, people are are happy to receive relevant advertising on their um, on their TV sets. So let's dig into that in a bit more detail. And obviously, with uh, you can probably hear from my accent, I'm uh, I'm I am English, and so I had to have a a, a photo up for uh, for. Um, what we'll have on the screen behind me uh, later on today. Um, but uh, thinking a bit more about, um, you know, what does this user behavior, you know, what does this really mean for advertisers? I thought it would be interesting to share some other things that, that I found really interesting. And, and I think um, learnings really that um, brands and advertisers should be taking into account um, as they are considering this space. And so, um, the first thing I was really surprised by, so um, here I don't have European stats, but looking at the US market, um, I'd always assumed that, that, that connected TV was really for the sort of younger people, early adopters, and that is absolutely not the case. So um, between um, Q3 2019 and, and Q3 2020, um, according to some research by Ampere in the, in the States, um, the typical... 55 to 64 year old viewing of OTT has doubled. So it's no longer just a medium that is used by, by young people. This is now a, you know, with 70% in Europe of, of TVs connected, this is broad reach, even in these, um, these now digital environments. I think um, another thing that's really interesting was around the, um, around the, the screen time being a family co-viewing experience um, and this is something that um, is popular in the states it's really popular in um, in Europe I think that the market in Europe where it's most popular is is Italy and um, in Italy back to that uh, that survey sort of 55 percent of people are watching um, activity on the CTV screen with their friends and family. So they're really making it a, a shared experience. And I think something that we've known about and a number of our customers at Beeswax um, are already making use of is really this idea of, um, of, of additional screens. And I think um, what was interesting in the, the sort of younger demographics that, that free will surveyed is that um, they often tend to um, have a preference towards consuming their their vod on a um, on a mobile device um, but here um, when they are um, keen to use a ctv screen a, a connected tv set it's really because they can then use their smartphone at the same time and that obviously has um, interesting um, ramifications and, and opportunities for, for, um, for advertisers. And so thinking ag again about, well, what the fact that the, the, the TV set is now connected to the internet, um, what does that really allow us to do? And here, this is something that's quite tricky because there are different rules 
in Europe by, um, by country and different levels of, of capability based on the, 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 the variation in the, um, in the um, approach that's being used. Um, but really, the, um, I think the, the, something that, that's really interesting is how much uh, CTV consumers really want to receive relevant video ads um, in some markets. So Germany is a standout here where there 69 percent of people who responded uh, to this survey were really sharing that they actually really want to uh, to benefit from from relevant advertising. And I think that's something that as we're starting to be able to have an influence um, with brands and brands are starting to think on their um, their approach and the creative approach within this space, um, I think it's really worth thinking about the difference perhaps between that Mark Pritchard quote around very narrow targeting and actually simply taking the concepts of relevance and focusing on making sure the right creative is reaching the right audience. And so what are some of the considerations that, that buyers should be, be taking into account? Um, well, the first thing to note, this probably sounds a little bit obvious, um, but um, most of the premium supply, when we really get to the, the, the super um, premium ends of the spectrum, we're really looking at programmatic guaranteed. Um, you can access some supply by, by private marketplace. There's very little supply that is available on the, um, on the open marketplace. So it's really important um, to have those strong relationships between the buy side and the sell side to make sure you can really um, explore and, and um, maximize your, your chances of successful uh, delivery of your campaigns. So you can access the, the right level of, of quality um, for, um, for, from the supply side. And so I think setting up those conversations, making sure you have the right connections in place um, to be able to have really good functionality around programmatic guaranteed and PMPs is really um, probably the, the number one consideration. I think it won't come to anyone, uh, it won't come as a surprise to anyone on the call, but um, premium inventory, um, whether it's CTV or whether we're talking about other environments, doesn't come cheaply. So I think it's really important to think about here the, the supply dynamics. How are you making sure you're getting the, the best price, but for the right quality of the supply? And um, depending on the environment, there may be different routes um, to that supply. So making sure you've understood um, that supply path optimization opportunity to be able to get the results that you need for that campaign. And actually, so that's a nice segue into measurement, thinking of starting to, to think about results. Measurement can be very, very tricky in this environment. I have to say, I've, you know, that there it's very unlikely that you might click um, an ad in these scenarios. And so I think start to think about what you are judging um, performance, how you are judging performance in these environments. We're seeing a lot of our customers um, looking at brand metrics. So um, reach and then also sort of brand favorability, um, but also, um, you know, perhaps also the, um, uh, depending on the, the format and the, the device, you know, video completion rates it can also come into it. And then um, also looking at, um, at the variations by, by country, I touched on this um, before, but there are some really different requirements um, by country in Europe, which, uh, which can be a challenge. And so it's, it's really um, important to, to think about those and to be, to be ready to know um, what you need to take into account depending on the, the country that you're, you're looking to, um, to activate in. And then, so um, in terms of then just summing up sort of the, the why um, for premium, well, we're really thinking about premium programmatic offering the, the best of both. So offering brands the ability to, um, to, to run their, their data-driven campaigns and take actionable insights from the activity that they're running, just as you can in any other programmatic 
medium, but really starting to think much more about the quality environment and the canvas that those ads are, are running on. And I think thinking about connected TV in particular, where you're running these full screen ads in a high definition video, um, it really is the perfect environment for storytelling and so you get the, the the best of both worlds the storytelling medium of of video but paired with that sort of right message right time right device advantage of of programmatic and so i know that i left a little bit of time for uh, for us to go into some q and a so um i'd yeah, sure. love to hear if there are any questions from the audience paul Absolutely. Uh, first question. Thanks for the prezzo. Does this apply to all environments or is it just TV OTT? Oh, in terms of uh, premium, uh, premium programmatic and this, this advice, it's a really good question. I mean, I've thought today specifically about, um, about CTV, but those um, points of advice, so thinking about private marketplaces and programmatic guaranteed, those are 100% the preferred transaction types across um, other formats and other devices um, if you're really working with, with premium publishers. So even if you're thinking about the, the best apps to be present in or the best um, news sources to be present on, you definitely should be, be thinking about those private marketplaces. You should absolutely be thinking about the supply dynamics um, I think they're particularly in in-app environments where you know sort of header bidding isn't really a isn't necessarily widely adopted. You know, a lot of um, the publish you know in-app environments will actually have uh, waterfalls between different SSPs. So different SSPs will actually receive sort of different levels of inventory quality for, for in-app. So I think that's that's definitely a, a good consideration. What else did I, did I flag? So measurement. Yeah, I think it's, again, probably good advice to, to think about um, what might be the, the best route to, to judge success. I mean, personally, um, I don't really see click-through rate as a, as a good mechanism for judging the success of a campaign in, in any medium. And so absolutely not on, on, on premium. I think there's perhaps less country by country variation um, when we get into um, into perhaps mobile and desk, um, you know, and, and uh, desktop environments, but there are still some markets where there are really specific mm -hmm. uh, supply considerations and uh, by by region. So, yeah, I think all of that. I think all of that advice still stands. Good question, yeah, though. Yeah, and you actually preempted a second question, which was about the nuances in, in different regions. So, I'll go and mark that one answered as well. Uh, and then our last question here, you are known for custom optimization. How can you think about custom, um, custom optimization in premium environments? Oh, I love that as a question. Thank you. <laughs> that. Um, Wasn't me. <laughs> Beesworx is, is indeed known for, for, for custom optimization. And I think um, really um, it, it's perhaps even more important when you're thinking about premium programmatic um, because the when you're thinking about premium you know we, we talked a bit you know you're generally paying for more expensive media and so using it more efficiently to meet your objectives is perhaps even more important than it is if you're accessing perhaps the you know lower cost and, and lower quality inventory and so things that we've seen people thinking about are um, you know perhaps more brand um, metrics in the premium space. So thinking about the um, the quality metrics that that matter to you as a buyer. So how do you define premium? How do you define quality? Taking those measures that you deem important for your brand and building out optimization, whether that's through um, just bid modifiers, whether it's through actually building models or even going as far as to do a, a custom bidding agent and really having your own code level control can allow you to really um, ensure that you are 
getting the most efficiency from that that premium media and I, I yeah I, I really think it's it's much much more important when you are paying top dollar for for that inventory interesting uh, we got one more question under the wire here uh, can you explain why pmps are so important as a buying route oh that's interesting i wonder if that's a question specifically to ctv or to some of the the the, the broader activity i think um we can talk about it from a from a broadcaster perspective and the specifically the sort of ctv route there is depending on the country uh, quite often um a requirement for the um the the broadcaster to be able to know who the advertiser is and in some cases even vet the the creative audit the creative ahead of time and so in order to go through that additional workload and that process, they want to make sure that there is a level of, of commitment in, in place and they have that, that reassurance. And so that really drives a need for, for programmatic guaranteed. For private marketplaces, um, it tends to be much more a, a choice of either the, the, the buyer, but more often the, the seller. If a publisher um, knows that they, they have you know, lots of potential routes uh, that they can monetize their supply. They have lots of demand from it. They really like to have a, a closer relationship with those buyers and they get that by establishing the, the PMP connection. It enables them to perhaps customize the deal in a way that makes most sense for the buyer in order to maximize the amount of um, spend that the publisher might get. And from the, the buyer's perspective, you get that opportunity to be able to, to perhaps negotiate in, whether that's on a you know, data perspective, whether it's more around the, the context and the environment which um, you're getting access to. You're really able to get better access um, perhaps to that, that publisher's supply through the, through the PMP route. And I know there are, there are some publishers who don't even trade on the open marketplace because they really want to make sure they are um, controlling which brands they are they're working with and so you know it, it, it's always worth making that connection if you're really looking to access the most quality supply and if whoever asked the question is a, a beeswax customer and would like to talk um, more about it or would like you know, we, we generally encourage our customers to have those direct relationships with the SSP so they can um, then be put in touch directly with the publishers. Um, and so if you need some help um, with that, please do mm -hmm. let me know. I've, I've put my contact details on the screen. Yeah, not to toot our own horn, but now as part of Freewheel, we do have a closer relationship uh, that uh, our customers can leverage and uh, get more direct with the supply sources. So with that, uh, thanks everyone for submitting your questions. Thank you, Katie. Uh, for hosting and taking us through this wonderful presentation. And like I said in the chat, there's the link to uh, Katie's blog post on the Free Will Insights blog. Um, and until next time, everyone stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you.